Well, we're continuing our conversations here in Davos to get a sense of what the outlook for the energy market is in 2017 and what the energy diplomacy uh, situation could look like post Donald Trump being elected as the U.S. president. Joining us now is Carlos Pascual of IHS. Thank you very much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. A big change for the world starting tomorrow with Donald Trump in the White House. What does it mean for oil and gas in specific and for the energy market? I mean, the promise of uh, easier regulations in the U.S., what will that mean in terms of U.S. production, for instance? I think for the energy market, Donald Trump's election as president is probably the least significant of issues that we might face. Maybe not so much in power, but in oil and gas not so much. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, the majority of the production is driven by thousands of producers across the country who have had phenomenal opportunities. There may be constraints on regulation, but the reality is that access to land and regulation has not been the factor that's been constraining American production. It's supply and demand and the mm -hmm. balance of the price on the market. Mm -hmm. And so on the margin, there may be some impact, but uh, generally, the steps that have been taken in the OPEC, non-OPEC agreement, the impact mm. that that's had on the price of oil, mm. much bigger factor than the election of Donald Trump. So what do you expect for 2017 as far as global oil dynamics are concerned? We've just seen OPEC say that uh, raise their forecast uh, for uh, oil demand to about 96 million barrels per day. Uh, how do you see this playing out? Um, on the demand side, one of the things that we're expecting is uh, a fairly strong growth, about 1.2 million barrels a day. Today, supply and demand are more or less in balance on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a huge change. Remember, a year ago, the world was producing on a daily basis one and a half million barrels of oil a day, more than the world could consume. So that, that balance has now been achieved. So mm -hmm. one of the questions is, will there be enough demand growth to start eating away at the huge inventories of stock that currently exist. Mm -hmm. A critical other question will be what's going to happen with the OPEC and non-OPEC agreement mm. on restricting mm. supply. Mm. If that holds, mm. if it stays what, within what, a region. What, what does your gut tell you? Do you believe that there is it going to be greater compliance uh, on that output cut deal? Look, there's going to be a lot of speculation about this. Um, one, a couple of things that we do know. Um, Libya and Nigeria were excluded from it. There yeah. could potentially be growth there. Um, Iraq um, was given uh, fairly easy terms. Iran was actually allowed to grow. Um, for the rest of the countries that are involved, for, in fact, for all of the producers, what they would be cutting back is somewhere in the range of 25 to 4%, depending mm -hmm. on the country. Mm -hmm. What they gain in net revenue is potentially between 15 and 20%. There's an economic incentive for them to do this. And so every single one of those producers is going to have to weigh on a day-to-day -day mm. basis. Mm. Do I stick with this agreement mm. and get 15 or 20 percent more revenue, or do I try to think that I can go on my own and gain more? Mm. And, and that's, that's the equation we're going to have to weigh every single day. In terms of production in the U.S., is that likely to be the big surprise in 2017? It's not going to be a surprise. It's pretty clear. It's going mm. to be restored. Um, we're, we're going to potentially see an increase from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, a growth that could be as high as 700,000 barrels a day mm -hmm. in the United States. And the, the, the big difference is going to be where price goes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's happened with the price collapse in to the period of 2014 to 2016 mm -hmm. is that American producers had to make themselves phenomenally more efficient and productive in order to compete and to survive. Mm. And so the weighted average cost of production in American shale has gone from $79 a barrel to about $48 mm. a barrel. And so if you see a price ban that's between 50 and 60, there's mm. going to be more American production. Mm -hmm. And so you very rightly point out, and I think suggest, that as that happens, there's going to be an interaction between that recuperation of American supply, mm -hmm. how that it, what influence that has on price and how that rebalances in the marketplace. So where do you see prices headed? I mean, you know, 2016 up 48 percent, 2017, what does the price outlook look like to you? So before what we had was a band of 40 to 50 dollars for the price of oil. That band has been moved to 50 to 60 dollars. We think that that is a band that's pretty realistic over the course of the year. Um, given the current supply demand balances that we have, some demand growth, there's going to be some speculation and volatility about what happens with OPEC, what happens with American production. Um, a critical question is if there's a significant growth in American production, mm -hmm. will OPEC revisit this agreement then again in a period of six months? 
but that remains to be seen. I think that we're, we're going to see a, a market that is in a balance, a place of balance between 50 and 60 that's better for oil producers than it has been. Whether it stays there may depend on some actions that have to be taken in the middle of the year. Uh, you know, the implications of the Trump presidency as far as climate change are concerned, how would you read that? You know, we've done the Paris Agreement. We know what Donald Trump has to say yeah. about climate change. Do you think that this is going to mean a significant change or was that largely uh, election rhetoric? We'll have to see. Uh, um, candidate Trump was pretty clear that he said that the United States would withdraw from the Paris Agreement. It's not a simple do thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've talked to others who have explained that it would take at least a four-year process in order to formally be able to withdraw. The United States could, with, um, could ignore it. But here are a couple of realities that I think are important to think about. The, the, the market for renewable energy is huge. Mm. The IEA has estimated that between now and 2040, it's a market of 7 to $11 trillion. That additions in power in renewable energy will be bigger than coal, gas, and nuclear combined. So for the United States, the question to ask is, do we want to be part of that market? Mm -hmm. And if you want to be part of that market, you can't be seen as a climate change denier. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the big challenges is going to be, is there a change in the rhetoric? Do we start, does the United States move away from ideology around climate to basically asking the question, is this a commercial area that is critical for American industry to be involved in and engaged in? Mm -hmm. For India, I think the answer is absolutely yes. For China, the answer is absolutely yes. The, the answer should be yes for the United States. Uh, let me end then by asking you about uh, uh, the redrawing of equations, so to speak, between the U.S. and Russia uh, with President Trump in office uh, and what that could mean as far as uh, oil diplomacy is concerned. Well, one of the things that is, I think, a landmark outcome for 2017 is that Russia is in a position of ascendancy. It has managed its, um, its interest in the Middle East in a way which is very tactical and strategic. Um, it has come out in a place that um, very few expected it to be able to come out in Syria. Um, it's managed to be able to save President Assad, at least so far, and to do that in collaboration with the Iranians. And despite the fact that those two actors are the primary, let's say, um, uh, opponents or uh, enemies of the Sunni population, they've also won huge respect mm -hmm. among the Sunni population because of their resolve. So I think one of the issues for Russia is that they have much greater leverage. They have also used that leverage in oil markets. They mm -hmm. were a critical factor in helping, ironically, OPEC mm -hmm. negotiate mm -hmm. its agreement mm -hmm. because of its relationships with both Riyadh and Tehran. And so I, I think we're going to see Russia in 2017 now trying to see how it's going to use that leverage that it's gained. Um, obviously, it's gained a great deal of leverage in, in oil markets, but it's bigger than that. It's mm -hmm. in security issues and mm -hmm. political issues. And I think that that's going to be one of the big geopolitical stories for 2017. Well, Carlos, thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18 in pleasure. Davos.